Oh, well, I my, my name is Chris from DSX Machina. I'm the publisher of Amethyst Ultra Modern and Affinity. And uh, on June 20th, we are launching a uh, new Kickstarter or a crowdfunding campaign more specifically for a reprint of Ultra Modern 5, which is our most successful product by a very large margin. So I understand you already have a, quite a few people backing this project. It looked like about 700 plus or at least 700 plus following. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So the campaign launches in a few weeks. We have about, we're just closing in on 800 people. Uh, like I said, th it works with this one because it's a reprint of, of, a, of a very popular book. Both uh, the original Ultramodern and the new Redo are both Mithril Batch sellers on drive through RPG. So they're very, very popular. Uh, the first Ultramodern was the fastest growing non, uh, like third party product that came out for uh, for 5e and uh, it still remains the most popular a uh, non-fantasy book for 5e so this is a reprint of that book but the big edition are the six new adventures that we're uh, that we're putting out so we could go into this and now we could talk about the adventures first but i think we'll talk about the six adventures last i certainly mm -hmm. want to talk about them but yeah. uh from what I can see, this looks like this is a, a Game Master toolbox or a Dungeon Master toolbox. I think I'd say Game Master toolbox because you're looking at something that's sort of more uh, science fiction, fiction rather than necessarily fantasy as far as I can tell, although there are mixes. Um, so how compatible would you say Ultra Modern 5 is with 5e? If somebody's played Dungeons and Dragons 5e, how easy is it for them to transition into this? Well, that's actually a very, very good question because uh, Ultra Modern 5 was the first non-fantasy um, universal rule set. It is a sandbox. It gives you everything that a player would require as well as a dungeon master. So it gives you everything in one book. But there have been, now been several uh, non-fantasy rule sets that have come out. Everyday Heroes uh, uh, just got released a few months ago. The biggest difference between Ultra Modern 5 and those is that Ultra Modern 5 was designed from the base to be 100% compatible to 5e. That you could pluck any aspect out of it, not the whole thing, even just take one, la one class or a specific group of weapons and plant them into your 5e game without having to adapt or change things. The classes are all, all, all intended to be compatible with traditional fantasy D&D. It's it that was the whole point. Unlike Everyday Heroes, which is based off of 5e, but is not compatible without adaptation. It uses 5e as the as as the base, but then modifies it. Ultra Modern 5 is not meant to be that. Ultra Modern 5 is meant for you to to use that sandbox and add that sandbox onto your DD sandbox and just makes the sandbox larger. So essentially you can even use this. So this sounds like this is modular. You can just take sections of Ultra Modern 5, plant it into your 5e game, or you can probably transition fairly easily from playing a, a, a fantasy 5e game and just play in a completely different setting just using Ultra Modern 5. Would that be about right? Yeah, yeah. The, well, there are actual modules, both we've released as downloadable content and ones that are included. We have a module for Techno Magic. We have another module that's called Ultramax, which takes D&D &D and spins it into more of a hardcore, brutally unforgiving, uh, something that's a bit more realistic in D&D &D terms, where people can suffer permanent injuries. And it's a it's a bit more inspired by the cyberpunk firefight rules than 2020, which had a lot more consequence to combat. Uh, and we have, like I said, we have a mecha system, magic system, so forth. So there are actually modules in in the book that you can remove and add in. And then we also have DLC, which do the same thing. We have one called Desert Power, which adds in Dune and Mad Max inspired technology as well. So one of the things I did notice is the you've got quite a few different fiction settings already lined up for this project, right? It's part of the book. And um, would you like to sort of, I mean, you've already mentioned a few of them, but I noticed that there's quite a few more that you haven't mentioned. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about that. You're talking, talking about the other settings I've published or the six that are being included here? I think it's the six. Uh, is it the six? I think you've got here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think I saw eight on Kickstarter um, that I would list it. Um, well, the Game Feats and Desert Power are DLCs. They're not full on adventures. Those are two. Okay. And that leaves six other ones. So four of them are adventures and two of them are campaign guides. Now, the adventures are um, 
starting off kind of randomly. We have one called Madness at the Megalomart. Uh, I don't think you have a Wal or Walmarts uh, where you are. Uh, we have both Walmarts. Can Canada loves big box retailers, Can Canadian Tire, basically like uh, you know places that have their own internal weather. You know, like clouds can form. That's how big the buildings are. And so we we have one thing called Madness Madness at the Megalomart, where you are an employer or I'm sorry, employee at a Walmart like uh, store, and the entire store gets sent sent to hell. And uh, so that's that's the basis of that adventure. Uh, Madness and Evil Down L Nine. Uh, then we have one called Clonefall, which is a cyberpunk style heist adventure. Uh, that one's being designed by uh, my co-writer William Miller. We have another one called The Phantom Stage, which is a Weird West, not so much uh, steampunk, which a lot of people confuse with Weird West. This is definitely pushing the Weird West aspect of it. That's uh, set in a variation of a town that's nearby us uh, called Barkerville. Uh, we have an adventure called Echoes of Noah 94, which is, I think, inspired by the movie Pandorum, uh, which is a uh, horror film uh, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, which I think is underappreciated. And uh, then there are the two settings that, I, that, that I'm writing. One's called Threshold, which is a giant space horror sandbox. And uh, then the Retroverse Chronicles, which is kind of a, a new, my new passion project, which is a alternative 1980s retro futuristic setting. And so that's what we have. And so the four adventures are going to be anywhere from 30 to 50 to 60 pages. And then the two campaign guides should be about 100, 100 plus pages. Okay. So I thought there was six adventures listed. And am, I, am I missing something when I was looking at it? I was reading through and they looked like there were six adventures. Yeah, like I said, that some people, I, I, we, we kind of lump them all as six. Okay. Uh, th threshold uh, is th threshold is kind of like a universal space dungeon making book. Uh, it gives you a setting. Uh, it allows the players to explore different spaceships, and then the maps are 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 swappable dungeon maps for spaceships, and you can swap rooms around to create the unique deck plan of this spaceship you're on. Kind of the way the old um, Space Hulk did it back in with uh, with 40k. Uh, but this one's more role playing based, but it uses the same uh, same uh, same concept. So it definitely is an adventure, but it's meant to be a longer standing setting. And the same thing with Retroverse. Although the Retroverse is going to be definitely more uh, like a campaign setting, like what I did with Affinity, which means there's going to be a story, and there's going to be an adventure, and there's going to be a setting. So it's going to be all three things at the same time in this book. So basically, you are saying four adventures and actually uh, two setting adventure sandboxes, basically. That sort of expand things out. Now I understand that more. I've yeah. got that. Okay. Now I understand. Now it's, that's clear. Um, so and on all of that is sort of delving into, as far as I could tell from the um, promotion on the website, this is really about weird Wild West stuff, techno fantasy, space opera, mecha or mechanoids or giant robots, whatever the heck it is, right? Piloting those, um, steampunk, modern warfare espionage and cyberpunk so we're really the theme is is not so much fantasy in terms of this book that's why it's called ultra modern right um i'm assuming that's the, that's the yeah that was the, that was the other thing conversation because i've talked with the, the creators of everyday heroes and we always have conversations the fact and they've said the fact that their universe their setting or their rule set was designed with a slant to be more modern age and i was trying to push two things i was trying to push trying to mimic science fiction movies and trying to mimic science fiction video games. And so a lot of the mechanics, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the pre-rendered uh, adventure ideas are based off of. And I think I understand where you're getting at with the six adventures. There are two other adventures that you can get, include in the package, but they're not being written for the Kickstarter. They've already come out. One's called Invasion Proxy, which is an alien invasion set in the green zone during the I I Iraq uh, reoccupation back in the early aughts. And one called Biohazard, which is a zombie apocalypse, but a zombie apocalypse that's very much inspired by Left 4 Dead. So it's not about you fighting fighting four or five zombies. An encounter might have 30 or 40 zombies in a single encounter that you have to deal with. So those are the two adventures, but those have already been made and there are options. Uh, where there, they are, there are two stretch goals where they get included free of charge. Okay. All right. Now that's 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 pretty clear. So <clears throat> now you're going to have to run me down. I'm going to just list off the things that I saw here and uh, get you to sort of give us a bit more detail. I mm. see that there are listed races, classes, archetypes, gear, 
monsters and scenarios as um, tools and new options in Ultra Modern 5. So let's start off the races. How many races and kind of what are they? Um, I need to think about this. Um, I'm trying, so if I remember correctly, there are 11 races in the core book and we were trying to skew them to being um, more sci-fi related. So if I remember correctly, we have got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine races, sorry, nine races. And we have uh, mutations, uh, a couple of aliens, robots, um, and, uh, some kind of psychic phenomenon, but most of the time they're, they're kind of inspired off of things we've seen. So an animist is kind of an animal human. So if you're running a, a gamma world adventure, then, uh, those come into play. The altered are more like mutants. We have the Kono and the Chitin, which are most certainly very alien. And so, yeah, so we have nine, nine races, but they're definitely, some of them are very weird. Like the morpher has no shape. The morpher just becomes whatever it wants. It's uh, and it, it, the image we have for it is almost something demented out of uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> well, okay. Well, that was a good movie. So, um, and mm. a remake of a good movie too. Um, classes. So, what? How many classes are we looking at, and sort of what are they doing? Uh, there are eleven classes. The uh, when we did redo uh, in 2019, we added the civilian class. The civilian class employs is, employs is, employs some kind of really out of the box thinking. Yeah, you do bag building with dice with the with the civilian. Yeah, um, that's one thing I, I try to do, and we you and I have talked about it, trying to create mechanics that you wouldn't expect to see D and D. And I've been playing a lot of board games and learning from them and going, okay, where can I do that? Uh, in Affinity, for example, we have a magic system that you ha have to use a deck of cards to run correctly. So a civilian employs a colored dice in a bag. Uh, we have face, which is an entirely non-combat class, which is something we wanted to make sure we could do, which is you're James Bond, but you're talking James Bond. Like the one where he's not the old school when it was Sean Connery and Dr. No, and it was all talking and very little, you know, the grounder, which is your typical action um, soldier, the gunslinger, which is your more cliche double pistol or single pistol type of thing. The heavy, which is the opposite, which is heavy weapons, heavy support, area effects, um, there's a lot of inspiration from fourth edition. So these do fill roles. Heavy is more of a controller where a grounder is definitely a bit more of a, of a, of a, of a, of a direct striker. The infiltrator is the rogue, but the, obviously we don't have as much magical stuff. The thieving isn't in there. Marshall, which is a leader leadership character, which is designed to kind of help all the other groups. So it's, it's a bard that's less annoying without spells that can do more with the group. And then we have a martial artist, which is our uh, non-racist um, uh, martial artist. You know, let's let's call it what let's call it what it is. Let's call it. It's a martial artist. Uh, we have a medic, which is self-explanatory. We we employed a traditional type of fancy and magic idea with medic. So medic has feats that they use. It works like magic, but it's obviously not magic. Uh, the techie, which uh, does mechanical stuff, crafting, but can also hot wire. And they have a, a shiny red button they can put on their guns to make them more powerful. And then we have the sniper, which is a sniper. Okay. Well, that's that's quite a lot. And it mm -hmm. pretty much covers all the bases. Yeah. Now, you also said archetypes uh, in, the, in the website. Are there uh, additional ar archetypes attached to these classes? Yeah. Or one of the things we... So, yeah. So one of the things we did with uh, our edition is that we pulled the archetypes to be class specific the original uh, 5e uh, phbs uh the archetypes were very much connected to specific classes and we decided to not do that we made all of our archetypes generic so you can not swap your archetypes to your classes now interestingly enough this is what WotC is doing now with their new edition of dnd one if they're not really calling it that but their revised version of dnd they're doing that now so when someone says, hey, you're, this is the idea D&D &D 1 had, I go, yeah, yeah, I had it four years ago. So yeah, we have 26 archetypes at the broad range from more specific fighting to mecha to uh, uh, explosive experts and stuff like that. So it's a very broad range. Now, I'm assuming with something like this that uh, it's it probably wouldn't be able to support multi-classing, but I'm sure that's going to be a question players will ask and 
dungeon masters or game masters will be freaking out about because I, I, I would certainly be freaking out about it. I'm not even though I have multi-classed, I, I'm not a fan of it. So I'm curious, how well do you think this is going to multi-class within your own system? I'm, I'm assuming it won't necessarily translate well over to 5e Wizards of the Coast products that well, but let me know. Well, it's interesting because uh, originally in the, in the old edition, we didn't have any rules for multi-classing, but we did actually include multi-classing for our classes. That being said, and this is something where I've said this to death about the fact that D&D is not really meant to be 100% balanced. It shouldn't have to be. It's not It's not owned up to that. It's not obligated on like a board game where you basically have to make it uh, to a fine tooth comb to make it 100% perfect. So um, there's nothing that says you can't multi-class a fighter and a gunslinger. Um, yeah, you'll get certain abilities and so forth. And yeah, the funny thing is, is, is if someone's going to find some kind of unbeatable combination, I remember when our classes first came out, there was a lot of initial criticism that our tech and our, our tech classes were not very powerful. And people were saying how the fact that even group of fantasy players, a rogue, a wizard, a cleric, and a fighter would just mop the floor with four sci-fi characters. And then over the course of several years, uh, now with the ultra release of Ultra Modern Redo, everyone's co everyone's coming back saying, you know, if you know how to play these gr this group correctly and you play it more like a team rather than for people doing their own thing and not communicating with each other, the the tech classes are nigh unstoppable and they will wipe the floor of a fantasy group. But it you, a lot of players walked into it thinking that they would be isolated, unique snowflakes, and not realizing that in a modern day and you're in a modern team, communication is key. And that was one of the big things we did. So, uh, but it, it, I, have not, I have no problem with people that are mixing, matching old classes with the new classes. I don't think someone's going to find some kind of impossible combination that's going to make it o OP, but you can do that with the core books. You know, it's one of those situations where you're going to find it and, you know, it's always up to the GM. The GM is God. They're, they're the ones that are going to say, boy, am I not letting you do that? Try, you know, and and I have feel that like I, I I always I always respond to people's comments about you know has this work and this work and this work, and one person found this astoundingly killer combination with the uh, with the sniper, and I looked at it and said, yep, that's true, but boy, do you have to be really lucky and be very specific on your ability? You have to do very specific things to get to that point, and if you want to go that direction, sure, because there are there were there were loopholes like that in fourth edition there are loopholes like that in fifth edition there are always going to be mechanical you know loops in there and the whole difference between a a video game and a role-playing game is that you have a human being the gm that can go no no that no that's not going to drive yes absolutely okay now gear equipment i imagine there's got to be quite a bit of gear and equipment in a book like this so um so what are we what are we looking at in terms of we're looking at, at 130 guns uh, they're split up into one-handed firearms, two-handed firearms, heavy weapons, and super heavy weapons. The super heavy weapons are mounted big guns. And and we try to make sure that there are certain things that are situational. Like we, we know that if you're going into a dungeon, the damn average dungeon is a five-foot step, is a five-foot space. So if, if you have like this weapon requires a 10-foot by 10-foot weapons platform, we're kind of inadvertently creating limitations on how you can employ this this type of weapon same thing with our power armor because we have we have regular armor we have power armor we have large mecha and some of the larger ones are large and go oh my god a large somebody piloting around in a large combat mecha would be game breaking i went great yeah but how many situations are you going to be in where you can actually use that in an, in a realistic situation the new abathus book i decided to throw caution to the wind and i created two crude huge mecha that operate as armor so two players are using the same armor at the same time and so if you have an initiative of 20 and john has initiative 17 at initiative 20 you get to use that power armor and move it around and then at 17 he gets to use that same armor which is now in a new position potentially and he gets to move it around and this is where you absolutely have to communicate because otherwise you'll have a very funny situation as as a, as a two players are moving the same mecha back and forth as they don't know, don't communicate. But it was just it, it like someone's like, that's game breaking. I'm like, yep. And it's going to be hella fun when you use it. But a GM that says, yes, you can have this 100% at all times and I'll give you opportunities to use it every week. I'm like, well, you're, you're creating your own situation there. So the sci-fi guns, we have something called tech levels. 
And so when you are, when your GM creates a setting or decides to implement this stuff, they set a tech level. Uh, tech levels start from one, which are your da- basic uh, powdered muskets and so forth, all the way to TL5. And TL5 are plasma weapons. TL4 are rail guns. We have nuclear particle accelerators. And then we have these offshoots like bioweapons that are that fire like living beings. Then there's lots of weapons that are directly inspired by famous video games. Like the Pico Positron is the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Um, there's a weapon, there's a very famous anime where there's a gun that transforms into other guns. So we have that. It's a pistol that can transform into three other pistols. Uh, I think we see that in the movie, in the video game Control. So that's in there. So there's a lot of movie inspiration in there as well. Uh, and then we have, so armor, I mentioned armor. We have 40 of those. Uh, some of them are said are large and they don't have arms. You have to mount weapons permanently on them. So they don't have reach. We've got cybernetics, vehicles, aircraft, uh, and those are all options for people. And, and like I said, uh, because players are expected to have magic items, sometimes an armor, like a power armor is going to say this counts as a, a legendary item and two rare items. So that's kind of how we try to throw a balance in there. If you have this armor, you're basically, you basically have three magic items. So if you're, if your group is trying to divvy up the loot, you have a situation like, I want that power armor. I go, oh, yeah, that counts as three, you know, then you don't get to get this cool gun and so forth. John gets the cool gun so forth. And so that's kind of, we, play around with that by creating balance and sometimes uh for example with the huge armor there's actually a level adjustment which means the moment you put this armor on your counter is one level higher when you're dealing with combat encounters stuff like that so there are ways we can do to play around with the rule set to to have all this cake and allow players to to eat them too so i would imagine it would be quite easy to take these ideas and transpose them into a fantasy game just reflavor it and and still just use the same mechanics behind it if you wanted to sort of like have um constructs or mech uh you know uh, multi m- more than one person operating like a, a, a some sort of construct in a fantasy world as well have they got prices on all these things i'm assuming you do yeah although i see the power armor can get exceedingly expensive with this new book uh, amethyst we do have we actually have uh, uh, vehicles the size of city blocks. We don't put price tags on those because there's no black market where you can buy them. Um, we do have prices on all the weapons, even on all the gear, even though it has some situations where you're like, this is not something you're going to buy. But sometimes we throw that monetary value in in case an engineer wants to build one from the ground up. They have an idea of the cost of the supplies required to build it. And that's what we were expecting more of. In Affinity, we took that same system and we exploded it into a much more complicated crafting system where every equipment item has all the little pieces that you have to acquire in order to assemble it. And it was inspired off of video game crafting systems. But to answer to your previous point, though, one of my favorite modules growing up, and this is going to show you how old we are, there was a very classic module, and you know what this is called. It was came out in the, in the I think, late 70s, early 80s. It was done by Gygax, and it was called Expedition to Barrier Peaks. It's one of the most famous, if infamous, adventures that I was ever made. For those people who don't know, Expedition to Barrier Peaks was an adventure when the players encounter a fallen spacecraft in a mountain. And the vast majority of the adventure are you is you exploring this gigantic multi-leveled spacecraft and you find power armor energy weapons and fight numerous creatures they re-released this adventure in the mid to early 90s but they gutted it they only put half of it 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 was in a compilation of four adventures and you could find it there but they cut out half of it i actually have an original first edition printing of expedition to barrier peaks and uh yeah, and that was always inspirational. And so the, one of the reasons why I did Ultra Modern was that if you wanted, you could do that. You could have. And uh, we actually did an adventure uh, called the uh, camera is called Fall of the Panda Crater, which it's the included module in my one of my Amethyst books, where we do exactly that. It's an up to date version of Expedition to Barrier Peaks, where players go to this mountain. And there's a crash the spacecraft, and it's fun. And that that was one of the biggest intents is being able to, to do that. Yeah, no, I um, I agree. Uh, actually, Expedition to Barrier's Peak was extremely difficult to get as a PDF. You just couldn't get it for quite a long time. I think it's finally now available. 
now that they're re-releasing all their stuff yeah 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 but it's it's taken them like 10 years to find uh somebody who had a copy who was willing to part with it so that they could scan it and then do you know what i mean it's just, give me a call yeah i have well. I, it's because it's it's the you know the, the old modules the cover wasn't bound to the inside because that was the screen you would take out so mm -hmm. that if i remember correctly i'm not gonna go get it but it has one sheet which is the cover which have two big maps and then there was a second one that was separate, which was another, and it had four maps. And then there were two books inside. One was the adventure guide. And the other one was a visual reference. And all it had was a variety of, let's be honest, very low quality. This is, this is, this is the early 80s. This is the artwork from the early 80s, d and Very low quality. The gun, for example, was the strange, it was like a, a sideways wand. Right. And then it came up over your hand and then was it was like it looked like a flashlight. It looked like a flashlight and didn't even have a barrel. It quite literally looked had the flashlight square. It was like an LED, but it was a laser weapon. They had one yet you had to hold it like this because it held onto your arm and it came out. You had to hold I was like, who designed these yeah, things? Yeah. But yeah, I have I I it's not in great condition, but I still have it. Now, uh so that's gear, armor, weapons vehicles and uh and various other things we've got monsters because like you can't have a fantasy uh game or a science fiction game without monsters or creatures so how many are we looking at and what sort of stuff are we uh likely to see in this book well in the core ultra modern book there's 70. we've been thinking about uh taking those and making an entire bestiary of just sci-fi inspired because I, I i don't know if anyone's built an entirely sci-fi bestiary so we have a beast, Jerry, and they're separated into different segments. The first one was just adversaries. These are generic human adversaries, and they have uh, a template you can put on them. Robot, alien, berserker, paranormal, ghost, whatever. And you can implant, you can add one of these templates to them. And there's about 25, 30 of them. And they range all the way from uh, CR1 to CR20. And some of them are like, you know, the, the pistol packing guy, generals, you know, you know, uh, martial artists. And you can add any number of these 20 or some uh, templates to. Then we have a series of kind of specific genres. We have um, a very much a Cthulhu section of Cthulhu inspired monsters. We have ones that are very alien inspired, but we try to rewrite the, the lore a little bit. So it's not so uh, it's a bit more different. We have a very unique creature called, called the skin, which are this oil base that can form. It was actually an interesting way of adding in D&D &D monsters. So this this oily substance can form creatures. And so you can actually say, no, this is a wyvern from D&D. &D. It's just made out of the this oil. And then we have a bunch of power armor, a bunch of robots, uh, and and so forth. So there, yeah, there are a lot of robots, a lot of weird, and a lot of aliens in there as well, and superheroes. We have we have some villain superheroes in there as well. Okay, okay, cool. And then, uh, well, I'm looking forward to the idea of uh, maybe in the future seeing a beastry on sci-fi um, creatures, beasts, and alien um, what's medusies. That'd be uh, that would probably be quite a lot of fun. Uh, next scenarios. I see that you had here scenarios. Now I'm not entirely sure what that means until when you say scenarios. So the scenario section is basically a bunch of, I wouldn't say random, but drop in, drop out action scenes. So if you're in a modern setting and you say, oh, we want to do a street, like a, like a, like a highway chase. Well, there's a section that says, here's a highway chase. Here's a highway map. Here's how you do the rules and uncommon, how you do a highway street chase. This is some of the obstacles and the DCs. Or you say, you know, we're, we're going to do like a, Black Hawk down military urban shooter. It's like, okay, here are the rules. Here's a way of doing combat encounters. Here are some of the creatures you, uh, here are some of the adversaries you can fight, how they would position themselves. So there's a whole bunch of kind of not adventures. They're like, like I said, they're action set pieces. There's something you're going to do in a day. It's one of those battles. So when you're running your modern sci fi cyberpunk adventure and you reach a point, where something can happen that fits into one of these scenarios, you don't have to spend a lot of work improvising that encounter. You can open up the book and go, oh, that's it. I'll change a few things here and there, but the encounter itself is is, is solid. So we have um, one, two, three, four. I think we have six maps that we include, all right? An urban city, uh, office building, uh, apocalyptic kind of open field, 
uh, an outpost, and then a street a street map, just a, which is just a, just a chunk of highway. Okay, all right. And like, how many pages are we talking about for a book like this? Um, it... it is three hundred and eighty three pages. Okay, so she's she's not a um, she's not a Wizards of the Coast publication um, at 380, 83 pages. <laughs> That's actually light. The average Amethyst book is four hundred. Yes, I'm aware, um, but I, I'm I'm making that point because you know I want to make that point for various reasons that I have that are my my thing. So this sounds. Do, do you not do you, do you not like small books or do you not like big books? I just don't like paying a lot of money for a small book that hasn't anything in there that I particularly like wanting to use. Uh, uh, I go with a shotgun approach. I go like a booyah base. Yeah. If I shove enough content, there's something in there you're going to like. Right. Yeah. And that's the way That's the way to go uh, rather than going light. So, <clears throat> and one of the things I've noticed is uh, it seems a lot of third-party publishers tend to actually have quite a, a large page count on their books. So I just wanted to point that out um, to those people who might be listening. Um, yeah, because I know you do this. You 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 don't you don't you don't skimp. You you put a lot. Well, of I'm a blabber. On. I'm not sure if you noticed. Uh, Quintessence is 414 pages. Uh, fact, Amethyst Factions is 400. I'm currently writing Revelations. I'm about 70 percent into it, and it's 385 pages. So I'm assuming once I add artwork and I get it properly proportioned, it's going to probably sit around the 400 page mark. So, and then of course, Affinity. Affinity were small. They were, it was planned to be 120 pages. They were 240 pages each. And there's three of them in a box set. So the whole thing's about 800 pages. Cool. Now, is there anything else that we need to say about Ultra Modern 5 and this Kickstarter that's coming out? Because now is the time. Well, for us, we have a couple things that are unique. So this is Ultra Modern launch in 2019. That is, if you look here, there we go. So that right there, that book behind me, that's the deluxe limited edition. Now, people, most people buy Ultra Modern uh, if they want a physical copy of Ultra Modern, they buy it and print on demand off of Drive Through RPG. That's about forty to fifty percent more expensive than what this is going to be if you buy it off of Kickstarter or if you or you know so forth. So we have a a proper physical offset edition, but you can also get this deluxe edition, which was which came out in the twenty nineteen Kickstarter. That one's got a um, a slipcase. Uh, spot UV coating uh, and a satin bookmark. But now for this campaign, we're launching this behind me, which is a leather wrap version. So it's going to be higher quality paper, leather spine, cloth cover with a sprayed edge. So it actually says ultra modern down the spray on this on the leaf edge and some embossment with the main logo. So that's being exclusive. We don't know if we're going to do a limited run. We may look at the numbers. Sorry, we look at the numbers and see. Uh, how many we're going to print, but that's the new exclusive thing to our to our rule set is this new leather cloth bound version. That's that's new to this one. No, one of the things I, I mean, I was looking at the um, the standard one, not the the special limited edition one. I actually really like the cover of the um, the standard one. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, oh, cool. Let's well, that's, that's actually yeah. shows the, the exactly. I actually thought yeah. it was quite good. Um, there's actually two covers for that. We're at, there's actually an alt cover, but you can also pick up for this Kickstarter, which is this one. Okay. All right. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask is pages. Are they going to be matte, uh, a matte cover or is it going to be gloss? Because you said high, high quality pages. So I was kind of curious as to what sort of page type we're we talking about here. Well, now that we have we have this new printer that handled our last project affinity and they have this wonderful page quality uh so I, i'm fortunate to have to say that if you if you get the ultra modern with this new campaign it's going to look a lot better than the than the 2019 version uh and that's something that we can't avoid just because we've we've worked with a new printer and i have a copy of this one right here and it's it's the pages are thick but they're very i have to say flat now, when I, it's impossible, even if I showed you the book, you wouldn't be able to really see it. But if I showed you the quality of the pages in Affinity, they are glossy, but they're weird in the fact that they're only shiny when you put it up to your like eye level and you see it, or when you flap the pages, when you stare at it, it has no gloss. And I don't know what kind of sorcery they've done to do this. It's this set, it's this weird, it almost has a metallic sheen. You know how metallic. Is completely kind of matte until you shine a bright light on it and then it reflects this is almost like that it has this weird sheen on it and i fell in love with it so that's kind of where we're going very high quality it's a semi-gloss but okay. it's not like shooting light back at the sun glossy which i know some people have issues with 
Yeah, yeah. And and actually, I think what you've done is probably smart because, I mean, one of the benefits of gloss is um, it's a stronger paper, right? But mm. you get that reflection, which makes it hard to read. Uh, and so if you don't have that reflection going on, particularly if it's late at night under a under a lamp, uh, most of us are not using lamps that uh, don't cause reflections or um, glare back. So it's, <laughs> it's not uh, something you normally have at your bedside. Yeah. Um, and the spine, is it uh, is it a... What sort of spine construction are we looking at here? Well, like I said, the it, it has a pretty good perfect bind on it. Uh, like I said, we the irony is that I have the the new version of the deluxe from the new printer, and it, it's it's a fantastically strong spine. The, uh, I had issues with the regular twenty nineteen printing, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a pretty solid. I think cloth. I don't. I'm not sure about the technical terminology, but it's uh, it's it's a pretty strong build. The leather one looks fantastic. Okay, well, that's, that's awesome. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Otherwise, I think we're just about done. Um, let's see, what else we have here? Um, I know that there has been talk about whether or not we'll do a physical print of these modules. These modules are currently digital only, uh, just because uh, it's, it's six different books, and we didn't want to jump into uh, into doing a physical for all of them. Um we uh, some of the things I know that uh, you can get uh, the leather set. Uh, we're also selling a, uh, the GM screen. The GM screen is a big four fold out, which is a wonderful illustration we did for the 2019 Kickstarter. But my uh, uh, my partner William is offering personalized role playing sessions. So the two upper top uh, tier Kickstarter levels uh, allow people to have adventures run by William. And I, I'm, a, I'm a very good GM. I think William is a better GM. I'm my neurosis uh, makes me playing with strangers is, is a bit uh, a bit complicated. But uh, yeah, so we're lo we're also only running for 20 days. We're not doing a full 30 day campaign. So we're just running 20 days from uh, to from June uh, tw 20th to I think July 7th or 8th, something like that. So yeah, just uh, just 20 days. Okay, cool. Well, look, hey, thank you, Chris, um, for giving oh, us thank you. all that information. Yeah. That's, that pretty much covers everything that we need to know about a product like this. For those of you who are interested in the Kickstarter, uh, I want to um, thank you for um, taking this time. And uh, to everybody, hey, um, go check out the Kickstarter. You'll find the information on the Kickstarter down in the description because that's where it should be. <laughs> okay. And Secret, uh, it's actually not on Kickstarter. It's on BackerKit. Uh, is it? It's on backer kit. Okay, it's on backer yeah. kit. Okay, so now well, there were a couple of reasons why we did that. There was uh, there were a couple of personal reasons. Like one, uh, you can get drowned out on Kickstarter depending on when you come out, and when if you, you know backer kit has a very large role playing um, back, uh, following. There's a lot of role playing games that go on there that do very well, uh, and also and, we're, and you and I have talked about companies corporations and ha having them be responsible we both know kickstarter has had a lot of controversies regarding being anti-union so we're, we're we're trying to give back a kid a chance and seeing whether or not we can raise uh, an equivalent amount of money using a non-kickstarter platform okay well that's that's great i i, I like the some sound of that that uh because yeah kickstarter um needs to have their um their butts kick it, kicked a little bit for some of the things they've been up to recently in mm -hmm. any case um hey thank you and um hey to everybody Till next time, keep rolling those 20s and go and check out um, Ultra Modern 5.